Good afternoon, and thanks for having us. Thanks for the intro. We're going to start with a word from our sponsors, I think. I just want to tell you that I am sitting here drinking a Dogfish 90 Minute Imperial IPA, and I just want to tell you that you are a <laughs> American made <laughs> beer. You rock out loud, sprinkles, and a mother unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the good thing about putting your 800 number on every can of beer that you make, is you come in on Monday morning and you get to hear these awesome stories on the, on the phone machine of people having fun with what you, uh, what you make. And as Mariah say, that's a word from our sponsor, because uh, it's pretty, uh, uh, hum you know, when, when Dan Danny invited us to do this, to say building a world-class brand, you know, that's pretty... Uh, um, gives us a lot of humility because we are our our company our brand is less than one tenth of one percent market share but in the niche way we do aspire to be a world class uh, brand and we're very lucky that essentially our brand has grown and been sponsored by our customers it's a real grassroots story that we'll get into but first I just want to congratulate uh, Danny and the whole team here uh, this facility by the graces of your sponsors and your hard work is truly uh, world class so it's great to finally be in this building and we're gonna have some Shake Shack before we go to the air, airplane too, <laughs> which is gonna be great. So uh, we'll start with a little bit of the history of our company and sort of get into the evolution of our, our brand. Uh, and then like Danny said, we wanna make sure that what we get the most out of this frankly will be uh, the Q&A. Uh, so like 20, 15, 20 minutes of that will be coming up. So you can kind of see our, we, we met in high school here in Western Mass. Uh, Mariah was from coastal uh, Delaware, where we ended up starting our brewery, but we met in, at Northfield Mount Hermon High School out in uh, Western Mass. Uh, Mariah got her public policy degree from here, and uh, I, I got an English degree uh, from Muhlenberg College in Pennsylvania. The day after I graduated, I moved to New York, started taking some write writing courses at Columbia, thinking I wanted to be a creative writer or novelist. To pay my bills, I worked at a bar across the street from Columbia that happened to be a first-generation craft beer bar, and the owner was only like five years older than me. Uh, so he was probably 27 or 28 and left sort of an IT career to follow his entrepreneurial dreams. So that was really inspiring for me to see a pathway to do that. And he and I started making homebrew in our apartments. And pretty soon I shifted from thinking I could write the great American novel to maybe I can express my creativity by uh, creating really compelling and unique uh, recipes and doing something creative in the world of beer that I saw at that moment was really starting to take off uh, in America. So uh, we, uh, I, I wrote a business plan uh, based around an Emerson quote. It was the first page of the business plan, which was, whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. He who would gather mortal palms must not be hindered by the name goodness, but must explore if it be goodness for himself, which is really... Um, any sort of entrepreneurial ideal, which is try and do something that doesn't exist, and if you tell that story evocatively, people will, will uh, follow you on your uh, journey. So I raised about $200,000, $220,000 to open the brewery, friends and family, my orthodontist put in money, uh, <laughs> the guy I built stone walls for and his wife put in money. Uh, our, our parents, our dads uh, put in money, and then we got a, a, a matching bank loan. We raised, I raised 110000 and got 110 as a bank loan, and away we went. We opened in 1995 as the smallest commercial brewery in America. So in that era, at that moment, there were 600 breweries in America in 1995, and we had the... Uh, the, the, the distinction of being the smallest of them. We couldn't really afford a big brewing system, so we cobbled together a brewery out of homebrew equipment and built a brewery out of tiny little kegs. But the model was to make a brewery inside a restaurant with an open kitchen window, because in that business plan I wrote, we will be the first brewery in America committed to brewing the majority of our beers with culinary ingredients to show that beer is liquid food and that a brewer should be considered as creative and breathless with their opportunity with ingredients as the world's greatest uh, chefs. So our customers could see us going out 
of our kitchen in one direction with beautiful plate coming off our wood grill uh, of, of really gourmet, unique foods uh, in one direction on the plate, and then out of that same kitchen with buckets and trays filled with brown sugar and peaches and pumpkin meat uh, into the brewery. And then those two things would converge at the table, and we would talk to every customer about what made that beer special, how we thoughtfully paired it with that food, and away we went. All right. So, um, as Sam said, we founded in 1995, um, got married in 96, uh, started a family, now have two kids, two dogs in coastal Delaware. Our, our one kid is in the back row there. He's a sophomore here at Brown, so. Uh, everyone <laughs> had point, to do everyone my point. job of embarrassing <laughs> if I could. <laughs> so, over uh, the last 24 years, we went from being a small brew pub in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, to um, through, through all that, and now at this point, we rolled into 2019 with you know, one brand, Dogfish Head, five distinct businesses. So a little bit about those businesses. We have two brew pub, or two restaurants. Um, in the middle here um, at the bottom is the building of our, of our brew pub. Um, we actually rebuilt that building two years ago, tore down the original, original brew pub and built a newer space that was um, just a better flow for our customers and our coworkers. Um, to operate in. Um, we opened a restaurant. So the, the brew pub, Dogfish Head, is focused mostly on beer, um, pub food, wood grilled food. We do live original music every week and that's sort of been our mantra for the uh, 25 years it'll be this June. Um, we opened next door a seafood restaurant that we wanted to focus um, more on our um, uh, distilled spirit side of our business. So we have a great cocktail program. We were actually nominated for a James Beard Award our first year open, which was pretty cool. Um, and it's all focused on sustainably sourced seafood from both the Chesapeake region and Maine. So 100% of our seafood comes from those two regions, um, which means we're limited in what we can sell. And we have some really creative uh, culinary leads back the, in, uh, in the kitchen that um, come up with some really cool stuff. Um, but so between the two, they're, they're adjacent to each other and connected with a courtyard. Um, on our sort of downtown Rehoboth Beach campus, and that's where our original brewery and our original distillery uh, were um, in those two restaurants. And then about six years ago, we um, opened a small hotel um, here in the corner, Dogfish Inn, in Lewis, Delaware, which is the next town over. That um, really gives um, us an opportunity to connect with our fans on a more than maybe a, a two-hour um, restaurant visit or you know them connecting through us to sipping you know drinking one beer which might take you know 20 30 minutes something like that so we have a way, uh, sort of a breadth of opportunities for our, our fans to connect with us and for us to connect with them um, and the inn um, is it's only 16 rooms it's small but it's connected by a waterway that goes from downtown Rehoboth Beach where our restaurants are out to Milton um, which is where our production brewery and distillery are, are and I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, and, and work with some of the work that Mariah is leading in our Beer and Bedevilers program that she'll get to is about helping to connect all these three towns, both so you could kayak, paddleboard, or ride a bike to get to all our locations using our inn as sort of a brand base camp to, 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 to see the beauty of coastal Delaware and everything we're doing there. So in the top right, you see our production brewery. As a reminder, you know we brewed 12 gallons at a time when we opened. And the tanks now are uh, 10,000 times as, as big as what we open. I used to write these Jerry Maguire letters to my coworkers saying, we can never get bigger than 10,000 barrels. We'll lose the soul of our company. And then we get over that and someone would show me the letter I wrote about that. And so at a certain point, I started defining what feels organic for our, grant, our brand to grow by saying, if I drive in our brewery, and as long as the biggest tanks don't just have one beer in them, in other words, our best-selling beer is 60-minute IPA, but I knew we would stay uh, off, you know, on, on, on the right path of our, our brand if we could do it in a way that celebrated the breadth of what we made. Because for an entrepreneurial company, a small company up against Goliath, you're never going to win at the, the, the pricing game, which means uh, that you're never going to be able to make an efficient business by being commodified into selling one product. Um, so we were always very conscious of that. And when you go in our, 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 our front door, you know, some of these tanks have 60 minute, but some of them have sequence in them, some of them have slightly mighty, some of them have pumpkin ale. And that dynamic range 
range of beers is really the halo that stands around our, our brand and has allowed us to grow, but also allowed us to maintain our position as the highest premium craft beer in the top 50. So the average craft beer sells for about $35 a case, and the average case of dogfish sells for $48 a case, because more ingredients uh, equals more cost. Uh, and we do a pretty good job of describing why we choose to put more ingredients into our beer and consumers see that still as a good value even though our beers tend to cost a little bit more than our competitive set. So we're among the earlier craft brewers, sort of first generation craft brewers, and we're definitely among the earliest generation of craft distillers. Uh, so we take sort of that same culinary uh, inspiration for what we do in our distilled spirits world uh, as what we do in our beer world, our best selling beverage out of this uh, distillery right now, fastest growing, is something called Sonic Archaeology, which was we brewed in a collaboration with uh, Sony and uh, Jack White, produced a, a show about that moment in history where there was a, 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 a confluence of different musical styles uh, from, from country uh, to, to jazz to roots music that, that kind of took hold in the, in the South uh, to create rock and roll. Uh, and so we blended all these different elements into that one beverage called Sonic Archaeology to kind of uh, um, put into liquid form that, 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 that concept. And it's got locally grown apples that we made a brandy out of, our own whiskey, uh, pomegranate juice, and lemon juice. Uh, so it's a, a fun project uh, for us. And as Mariah said, the inn is a place we go deep. Tomorrow when we're home, I'll go to the fire pit at our hotel and hang out with our 16 uh, guests by the fire pit drinking beer and they bought the beer so they're going to tell me for real what they're thinking of our brand and we just say for one hour we talk about beer and, and, and we try to have one conversation going so we can hear each other and it's a dialogue not a monologue and it's probably my most fruitful meeting of the week if you think of people that cared enough about beer to spend a vacation at a beer themed hotel there's so much that you can learn from them one time I had uh, 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 Jim Perdue co-host it with me from Purdue Chicken, which is down the road from us, and he grilled the chicken on the, on the fireside, and then we talked about beer and chicken. He's like, damn, I gotta start doing this. When we do focus groups at Purdue, we pay people to tell us what they think. So of course they're gonna say, oh, your chicken's great, give me another 30 bucks, and I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you that again. But if you could do a focus group where people pay to tell, pay the hard money to tell you what they think of what you're doing, you're gonna get really honest feedback. So that's a critical, uh, 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 component to understanding our brand through our customers' eyes. Uh, and then so, uh, switching to the next thing. So, you know, we started as the smallest commercial brewery in the company. We grew as a mom and pop company, family owned. Uh, and then we really saw our industry changing. When we opened, there were 600 breweries in America. Today, there's almost 8,000. And the reality of our, our, our industry is that th there's two craft breweries opening every day in America, and there's always room with a, for a new one if any of you are aspiring to open a beverage company or a brewery, as long as you do three things beautifully, be quality, consistency, and well differentiated, there's always room for another small brewery. That said, to grow a national brand in a world with 8,000 brands, a cacophony of all those brand voices out there is very difficult. And we really saw that our industry was bifurcating really quick into what I'd call the jaws of death, where the lower jaw is all the tiny little taproom breweries that don't really distribute. The customer comes to them, and that's a very strong economic model because they keep their margin, distributor margin, and retailer margin. And then the top jaw of death is the top 20 big breweries that have market power in America. And at number 13th, we were firmly on that top jaw, but it was hard for the customer to see the front of that smile. We were behind Anheuser-Busch, Miller, of course, all the bigger brands, but still trying to be a national brand. And so the, earlier this year, Mariah and I said, look, what we care most about is our brand's opportunity to grow and our coworkers' opportunity to grow. So we made the choice to merge with the Boston Beer Company uh, earlier this year. So we are now part of a company that is the largest independent American-owned craft brewery. And a really scale scary data point is we're the largest craft brewery, American craft brewery, and yet we only have 2% market share. So we're up against, if you think of us as the biggest of the 8,000 American breweries, and Yingling smaller than us, and you know, Harpoon smaller than us, and, and, and downward, it shows you the competitive dynamic in our industry and how challenge, challenging that is. But now joined with Boston Beer, we have very complementary cultures, which we'll talk about, but also a very complementary portfolio. So we have Sam Adams, the best-selling craft lager in America, 
Dogfish, number one makers of sours and, and locale IPAs, other IPAs. Truly the number two seltzer brand in America. We gotta catch White Claw. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have laws, but we gotta catch White Claw. Uh, uh, Twisted Tea, the number one alcoholic tea in America. Uh, I'm sure you guys have hit the bag. Uh, Angry Orchard, the number one, the number one cider in America. Uh, Wild Leaf, which is our high-end tea. Tura, which is our alcoholic kombucha. And then we have some incubator brands with little R&D breweries in Miami, New York, and LA uh, as well. Oh, you do this way. So um, as a part of the Boston Beer Company, obviously we have a lot more resources, but we're still committed to our brand in terms of our production facility is still based in Delaware and all of our marketing team, all of our, um, uh, you know, co-workers that are in Delaware are still in Delaware doing our things that we do every day. Um, and so as a brand, now instead of a company, um, we still have the same um, compass, which is sort of our uh, mission statement, if you will, for a company that's been this way for a um, very long time. Um, and, you know, it's still our goal to be considered the most thoughtfully adventurous beer-centric brand in America. Um, thoughtfully in that you know, we want to be adventurous, but not just for adventurous sakes. We don't want to just throw spaghetti at the wall, even though we, we do throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall, but we want to do so with some thought. And so if we're sort of rolling out new, um, new innovations, we want to do so with innovations that we can scale, that make sense, and that um, consumers are interested in, in, in enjoying. I, th and I think Dane talked about something that you teach is in four tenants, and the last one is you got to make sure your ideal is sustainable. So thoughtfully adventurous is about be well differentiated, pioneer, but make sure the economic model allows you to keep doing that. Um, so this is sort of the condensed version of the Emerson quote, which says the same thing, but actually fits on a six pack. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so we adopted it sort of as our, our raison d'etre, our reason to be as well. And the, 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 the choice in language is very intentional. You can see that we put we are off-center people in that order because we really are a culture that is uh, people first and product second. I've never once, or Mariah, referred to anyone we worked with as our employees. No one works for us that skews us out to think about, like indentured slavery or something. And uh, if we just refer to each other as, as, as co-workers and, our, uh, and try, you know, respect is blind to an org chart. Uh, everyone at our company, we value their unique talents and what they bring to our uh, our journey and recognizing Chris, uh, who runs sales here in, in Rhode Island, Connecticut, and all you've brought to our, our, our company here in this neck of the woods is Thanks, boss. very meaningful, <laughs> very meaningful to, to us. Uh, so that is, is really uh, critical to us. And when I said, you know, the decision to, to merge with Boston Beer was a, a massive, uh, massive decision for us, but it wasn't a hard one for us to make, Not, mostly because of the opportunity to grow, grow our brands, grow opportunities for coworkers, how complementary our portfolios are, but also how complementary our cultures are. So Dogfish Head was the first beer brewery to do a collaboration with Sam Adams about 13 years ago. Jim Cook and I uh, did, did, a, did a beer called Savor Flowers, where we distilled rose water in our distillery and then trucked it up to to, uh, to uh, Boston and added these edible flowers to, to this beer. And I got to meet his other coworkers and saw how, how similar they were to our. And once we started the negotiation process, we, uh, we kind of pulled back the, 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 the veil and, and shared sort of our company's sort of value tenants, what we call um, our rules of thumb, and Jim shared his. And this was our first, and their first is we are the Boston Beer Company. It was the exact same concept of people first and product second. And it's a company that is for 30 something years been a true meritocracy where they don't care, you know, what school you came from, you know, the color of your skin, what sex you are, people there, if they create their oppor own opportunities uh, and they really care for the people and really reinvest in them. So that really helped us decide uh, to go on this journey. There's the long quote that I've already said. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about sort of building up our community as part of our brand building strategy. Um, uh, this is sort of outside of the inn. Um, around the fire pit, which is sort of right there in the corner. Um, but as Sam said, sort of every every Saturday night, um, we have this opportunity to connect with consumers directly. Um, this was a particular, particularly larger weekend with more than the 16 rooms of guests, but um, it was an event we had, and that's one of our brewers up there playing guitar. And, and it's, it's just an opportunity to connect with, um, with these folks. Because when we opened the brew pub in 1995, we were connecting with consumers 
face to face every day, whether it was, you know, waiting on a table or handing a beer over the bar and talking to them and explaining to them what that beer is. And as a side note, um, waiting tables is like the best customer experience that you're ever going to get. Um, being able to walk up to a table, assess the table right then and figure out sort of what your pitch is and how you're going to interact with those guests. Um, best training ever. So and sometimes ever, they're pissed at you. Sometimes they're yeah. nice. And, as an <laughs> and you got to roll with that. You got to deal with it. <laughs> so, um, but from the, over the bar at the brew pub to working beer festivals every weekend, it just sort of grew in terms of that was the sort of the way that we were engaging with our consumers. Um, at that point, it was a, a was on a a face to face sort of level, and it let us hone those stories and the and the messages that we were telling about our brands. Um, and those stories, I think, are what really helped to us to build um, our community. Um, there we go. So we at this point, you know, we have a, a, a probably. F I put five, but there might be more. But these are sort of the communities that we're thinking of, like sort of who we're interacting with, who what, you know, what what we need to sort of um, how, why we need to be relevant to all these different these different groups, because cre creating the stories is is one thing and having a great story, but if it's not connecting, then it's kind of pointless. Um, you got to make sure that your your stories are connecting with your different communities, and that's where it starts to get really interesting. When you're when you're um, engaging with folks, you're not only telling your story, but you're getting feedback and you have the opportunity to listen. And as Sam talked about earlier, with you know more of the traditional focus groups, that's sort of uh, a, a way to listen. Um, but it just you know hasn't been the way we've done it. Not to say we'd never do focus groups, but it just we feel like this is just more, much more authentic and really creates sort of a two-way dialogue um, with all those different groups. So these are just some some pictures from events and stuff. But I mean, it's kind of crazy when people tattoo your logo on their body. So I mean, we have uh, so many customers that come in and to the tasting room. And they're like, "Look at my tat." And we're like, "That's on your body!" Like, <laughs> wow, that's really cool. Um, so I mean, obviously, we we need to connect with drinkers, um, potential drinkers who maybe haven't had our beer but like craft beer. Um, our coworkers are a very important community. They're our biggest advocates out into the bigger world. Um, our guests that come and stay with us or eat with us, dine with us. Um, our local community is super important to us. As Sam said, we have an initiative called Beer and Benevolence, and it's really about really connecting with our local community, um, not just through sort of donations and, and investments like this like little kayak launch here, but you know, really through a lot of uh, service work in our communities, connecting our coworkers. Um, as they're moving to coastal Delaware with the stuff that's going on around them. Um, and then sort of the more recent way, we've really um, been pretty on the forefront of um, connecting with, with, get, with uh, drinkers and fans is through social media. Um, you know, now it's, of course, every company is on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. But um, we were definitely there when all those things were invented because they haven't been around for 25 years. Um, and we were one of the first craft breweries to really get engaged and start communicating with fans through social media. And um, at this point, we're probably in the top three, depending on the platform, of craft breweries with social media followers. But I think what's more exciting is that we have really great engagement with our fans, which um, to me is more important than our um, follower count. But we, um, we keep that. We do that all in-house. We actually have two of us that do it. Um, myself and other woman, and we're getting ready to hire a third person onto our team. But um, it's again, it, it's not handing the beer over the bar, and we can't like see their face when they drink it. But we can be there and talk to them and listen to them, which um, uh, allows us to talk to guests sort of all over the country and the world um, about our beers. Oops. There you go. Innovation. Yeah. Well, talk innovation a sec, but I do want to give props because when I got her uh, public policy degree degree here, it really was her that let, if I'm sort of the analog face and voice of our company because I'm out doing a lot of events or TV or, or movie opportunities, Mariah's the digital voice of our company and really got onto these uh, platforms early and figured out a way that our voice could sound like it was even if we were just in the bar talking individually to people. Like when we do our, our work on social media with Mariah's leadership, I guess it's like one out of 50 things, engagements we have online is about, hey, try this beer. 
because we're not trying to do that hard sell. We're trying to have an ongoing dialogue with these people so that they trust our brand and feel like they're part of our company instead of always feeling like they're getting a hard sell. Uh, so that's been important uh, to growing our brand. Uh, I think we have, what you say, the third largest brand reach, and yet we're the 13th largest brand, so we outpunch our weight online because of the work uh, Mariah and that team does. So innovation, again, so there's different business models, and uh, if, you're a, if you're a bigger company, more entrenched with bigger resources, oftentimes you're, you're taking sort of the fast follower uh, approach to business where you're like maybe not so great at taking risks and pioneering new ideas, but you know you're great at execution. And so you're just watching what's happening out in the marketplace and saying, oh, that little company's got a great idea. Let's steal it and go in and use our awesome resources to, to become number one in that space. That's never been Dogfish Head's model. We've always been, rather taken risks and be pioneers in areas. And sometimes we fail epically and there's no niche that we thought was there, but oftentimes we find some white space, we establish a niche, and then the, the, the fast followers come in behind us. And if anything, that gives us the halo of being recognized as pioneers as people jump into the niches that we create. Um, so, you know, we did the first uh, beer coffee hybrid with chicory stout in 95, the first fruit infused IPA with April Hop in 97 in America, the first Imperial uh, IPA in America. So this one's kind of cool. Uh, I don't know, maybe Danny and some of the people close to my age remember the vibrating football games from the 80s. So I, I was watching a chef talk on a show about adding uh, pepper to the entire time he simmered a soup. And he said if he added that volume of pepper in tiny increments instead of all at once, the nuances and complexity of that pepper would be woven in more gracefully and, and uh, to the soup and make it taste better than if you added the whole volume at once. I thought hmm, maybe I can apply that to brewing because traditionally in brewing you add hops twice, once early for bitterness, once late for aroma. And so I remembered seeing this vibrating football game at a, a Salvation Army store down the road from the brewery. Watching that chef show, I went and bought the, the game. I duct taped a plastic bucket to the top of the game filled with pelletized hops and then put it on a step ladder over our boil kettle. And just by changing the angle of the vibrating game, I could control the rate that the hops would, would go down the, 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 into the boiling beer, real MIT shit, real, real, tech, <laughs> real, tech, real technical stuff. Um, but, it, but it worked. When you continually hop a beer, and we were the first ones to do this, it makes for a beer that's incredibly hoppy without being crushingly bitter. If we added that same volume and weight of hops in a more traditional manner, it would have a lingering bitterness that would be unpleasant. But by coming up with this concept, it made the beer uh, really approachable but intensely hoppy. And it's pretty cool. Like two months ago, we just found that, uh, that, uh, that they wanted to capture some of the uh, instruments that progressed the craft brewing renaissance in America from Charlie Papazian, sort of the father of the home brewing movement. They have his original uh, wooden spoon in the collection. And then they also have, you know, right next to the, the Wright Brothers plane and the Apollo uh, thing, they have our vibrating football game in the, in the Smithsonian now. Uh, so that off, obviously makes us proud. And so here I won't get into the breadth of the beers that we do. Those of you that are of age will get to try some with Chris Mariah and I later, including our newest collaboration with the Grateful Dead, uh, a Hazy Ripple IPA. So we definitely at Dogfish believe more in focusing on the good karma that comes with being all about collaboration than the negative energy that comes from focusing on competition. So whether it's with the Grateful Dead or we just did these shoes, trail running shoes sequence with Merrill, uh, the opportunities to collaborate with like-minded companies and exponentially uh, increase your audience reach by finding brands that have a complementary demographic to you, and you learn so much about your own brand through the eyes of whoever you're collaborating with, uh, has been really a big part of our, our journey. So these are our four core beers uh, right here, some of which we're going to get to try. And we move into another thingy. Okay. So we see them there. So I mentioned, we're not serving this one, but just want to show you this is our best single selling beer. Uh, it's likely that either next year or the following year, slightly mighty, we'll, we'll may overtake it. Uh, but it, it's sort of our, our, our version of a se session IPA for non wussies, I would say. <laughs> and then that's 90 minute IPA. That is the original. There was no Imperial IPA in America until we came up with this. There were IPAs, there were Imperial Stouts, but we invented the style of Imperial IPA. There's now over a thousand of those 
uh, brewed in America. Ours is the second best selling one in America. Slightly mighty, so that you, when you're choosing brand names, you wanna do something either creative or evocative, but hopefully it's one that's both creative and tells the story of what differentiates your product. In this case, here's a beer that's slight in calories and mighty in hop character. So it has the exact same calories as Michelob Ultra, which was, I gotta give ABI credit, they, they, they did a good job of identifying younger people looking for wellness uh, attributes in beer where you don't usually find it, but sacrificed a ton of flavor to do it. For us, the breakthrough here is I found monk fruit, which is a Chinese extract uh, that has no calories yet is hundreds of times as sweet per ounce as table sugar. And the mug fruit adds, acts like a skeleton inside the beer, which makes it, it gives it body. And then we can pack like a hop muscular uh, uh, note on top of that. So it drinks like a normal IPA and yet only has the calories of, of Mick Ultra. Sequential, number one selling session uh, uh, sour in America. Uh, with this one, it was uh, we were trying to brew a beer. That's, the name again is means uh, it's three beers brewed in sequence: a Kolsch, a Berliner Weiss, uh, and a Goza. Uh, we worked with uh, I was with, uh, Jeff Gordon, the NASCAR racer, uh, became a friend because his wife's Belgian. They're in a good beer, and I was up watching a NASCAR race in uh, Dover. He was showing us our car, his car and how every inch of it was thought through ergonomically for his body. I said, hey, what's that tube coming in the driver's side window? He's like, oh, that's where they feed in my special custom Gatorade. I'm like, oh, sweet. You got to pick your own color of Gatorade? He's like, no, actually, they hooked me up to all these wires and tubes, and they monitored my body at 150 miles an hour and 130 degrees for two hours and figured out physiologically exactly what liquid I need inside my body. And I was like, oh, my God, can I talk to the scientists? And so he got us in touch with that guy who was used to former heart head of the Gatorade Research Institute. And I, we basically designed this recipe where I would send samples and chose specific sea salts from the mouth of the Chesapeake and off the, uh, off the coast of Maine to, to amplify the electrolytes and minerals and targeting the same level of uh, hydration characteristics in this beer that Gatorade has. The federal government won't like, let you make health claims for a beer. Uh, so, so we can so say, we don't. We can say it's <laughs> thirst quenching, uh, but we can't say it's hydrating. So we're gonna have to just ruin, we're gonna burn this film, uh, Mike, because I never said the word hydration. <laughs> but if you end your night with two sea quenches, you're gonna, you know, sober you is gonna thank drunk you if you did that <laughs> the next day, the next day. That's all we have. <laughs> So I think we are at the Q&A part of our, our discussion, and uh, let's do this. I hope you guys have some questions. Danny, you'll tell us how we're doing on time. Yeah, there may be some people who have to leave at um, a little before one, and that's fine. We're not offended. But we also want to shift gears at some point, whenever you feel is appropriate, so that we can have some tasting. Yeah, so probably 12 or 15, 14 minutes of questions, and we'll shift out there. Is that right? Come on, it's going to be some questions. Do we, should I pull this, should, should I, Mike, should I'll I throw yell. him the thing? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. How'd you guys fail? Tell us about your failures. Uh, I'm afraid we only got 14 minutes. So. <laughs> What's one of your favorite quintessential dogfish fails? Well, our lavender beer was, was, is one that we came out with a, uh, what's it called? Something uh, high alpha wit. wheat. High alpha wheat, which we put lavender in, and it was absolutely terrible. It was like, floral and cloying, and I think you said it tasted like Cassine Laura Ashley. It was just not a good beer. It just didn't go well. Um, and then I will say some of the other failures. I, we, we, that lineup that Sam showed about with about 14 beers on it. So that's our, annual, that's our lineup for this coming year. But we, every year that changes. So we'll put a new beers into that lineup and see how they do. Um, if they aren't like awesome in the marketplace, they quietly go away. We say they're on hiatus, and sometimes we'll put a beer on hiatus that's that's um, underperforming. But sometimes we'll put a stronger beer on the hiatus to let it sort of get some more sort of rest, and then come back in the market with a different splash. But um, so that that's always changing, and gives us a lot of, of opportunity to sort of see how beers that do well in our brew pub and tasting room do when they get out into the marketplace. I'm going to put Chris Martin on the spot and say, what's a beer that's over? That that that's produce that's selling differently in Connecticut and Rhode Island than our national trends, either for better or worse, to show the regionality of, of our industry. I would have to say the hazy IPA phase in this area is obviously taking off. 
Uh, probably not so much in the cell, but our liquid truth serum. And really excited to see what the case of Yeah, liquid truth serum. I'll let you tell that. Uh, but, and then uh, we, with the advent of Hazy Ripple coming to the market, uh, we're seeing some really big uh, numbers from that, almost exceeding 60 minutes. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a So it's a, it's a sweet style, in a, in a wonderful region called New England. So it's gonna sell well. The hazy Ripple people now available locally in six packs in Rhode Island. <laughs> Question where? Um, you raised, you mentioned raising two hundred and twenty k to start. Did you have to raise any more money? Or did you, did you <laughs> yes. Uh, that's a great question. So yeah, we you know. As a, in a high growth industry that's a bricks and mortar oriented industry, you know, if you come into an awesome idea in, 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 in digital or tech, oftentimes you can scale that idea without a lot of dollars going towards the infrastructure. But our business is very linear. To brew 100,000 barrels more beer, you need 100,000 barrels more tanks, more canning. And so, yeah, we had, we, we were always, it's always been a mom and pop company. We always, had majority ownership as a family, but we have invited in different eras, different minority investors in who had different sort of complementary superpowers to us and could teach us things while they invested. And every single one of them made a premium coming in, sitting on our board, teaching us stuff with, an, with knowing that we had no intention to sell out to ABI Miller Coors uh, or to go to an IPO, but that they would make a premium if they helped us on our journey. I don't know what you'd say about that. Yeah, and I would say about Four or five years ago, we partnered with a private equity company that came in, and they were in for five. They were 14, going to be in for five 14 years. 14% of the company. Yeah, 14% of the company. Um, and so they were going to be in for five years. But when we saw the market change, and then we started talking to some strategic partners um, like Boston Beer, they um, were awesome. They were on our board, but they said, yeah, we'll go out early. Um, and we had learned a lot from them. And, you know, I know you were on the phone yesterday with, with their principal. So they, they've been great for, you know, they were, they were, I guess, the good guys in private equity. And we heard all these stories, but um, we had a really great experience with that. Yeah. Try to, I, I recommend if you're thinking about private equity, if you're growing a company, find a group that has a principal that's inordinately religious because they, they, they believe that if they fuck someone in this world, they're not gonna get to the afterworld. And this guy was the most ethical private equity guy you could, you could ever imagine. Uh, and and a, devout, a devout Jewish man as well. So it worked out really well for everyone. Yes? You said the three things that small breweries need to do well to succeed is quality, consistency, and differentiated products. Which of those three do you think small breweries go wrong at the most? Or which of those things is the hardest to accomplish? Um, was well, super small, super small. I'd say consistency. I mean, like it wasn't probably until five years in that we got our first lab, and that compared to what we have now um, was literally a. It was the broom closet, and we created a little lab in there, and um, we had one person working in there. Um, so with with beer, with you know, it's a living product. We don't pasteurize our our beer, so yeast. You know, we have to take care of our yeast. Um, so for us, consistency, uh, small breweries, you know, generally can't afford that and generally don't have that expertise in house, but it's really important for folks. Like we had a brewery that opened literally right before we opened in 1995 in Delaware and, um, they went out of business because the first batch of beer that they, they made, they had to release and it, it went bad in the marketplace. It just wasn't good. So, um, that consistency I think is, is, is the thing that you see the most challenges with with small breweries. Yeah, we, we have a line item on our P&L that's damaged and dated goods. And we put, I think it's three or $400,000 on that line item every year. And it's for beers that did not come out perfect. And a lot of breweries in desperation for cash flow will be like, eh, it's not perfect, but we're still going to put it out in the marketplace where we make sure we catch that in a, in a sophisticated lab if a batch is, is inconsistent and we spend the money to dump it out. The goal is to catch the problems before the beer gets into the marketplace primarily so the consumer doesn't know that you had an issue. And secondarily, you're trying to catch the problem before you package the beer in cans or bottles, because in a lot of our recipes, the packaging can be more expensive than the liquid. So at least if you catch it while it's still in the tank, you can dump it, and the cost of goods of doing that is less expensive than dumping it once you've uh, packaged it. Right to that point, uh, if you could sell your beer in any container, what would you sell it? So uh, probably draft right out of the brewery where everyone came to us. 
uh, instead of through distribution. <laughs> but like every brewery in the world right now, Dogfish Head wishes we built a bigger canning line and a smaller bottling line because younger drinkers are gravitating towards cans compared to Gen X and boomers who wanted their premium beers in, in bottles. I think both for the environmental impact and the po po potability as well. I don't know, am I answering your question? You're but what would you want to sell? I actually now, we probably drink the majority of what we drink out of uh, cans. So you're saying what I per personally prefer to drink or if sell? you package it anyway. Do you and, want to, you know, I feel like I'm not sat satisfying this man with my answer, <laughs> Mariah. I'm going to drop the mic over to Mariah. Oh. I mean, I think one thing we were, uh, we were talking about earlier on the walk over here is sort of Belgian beer culture. Now, it's not how they package it, but how people drink beer in Belgium. It's all about proper glassware. And every bar you go to in Belgium, every style of beer is served in proper glassware. Um, so that would be really cool if you always had beer in proper glassware. But um, And I mean by style, like there's different glasses that uh, accentuate the uh, flavors and the esters and all, all that stuff for different styles of beer. So I think that would be pretty cool. What do you see as your biggest challenge in the next 10 years, like in terms of what you want to achieve or what you see? <laughs> so uh, honestly, uh, I think the biggest challenge for, um, for any brewer, craft brewery, Pri primarily is just shifting uh, tastes. And so it starts with, this is probably the first generation where the younger generation seems to care more about their health than the older generation. It used to be that the old people are like, you better eat better, you better drink better. But it seems like Gen Z and millennials are more focused on calories and wellness than Gen X or, or boomers. Uh, so I think there's a staggering statistic, like the average 22 year old right now is drinking 22% less beer than a 22 year old was 22 years ago. So it's pretty staggering to think about. And so the, the explosion of seltzers like White Claw and Truly is part of that because they do a good job of marketing that's 100 calories per, per glass, which is why Dogfish Heads really try to innovate on lower calorie uh, active lifestyle oriented beers from Sea Quench, where the proposition is it's quantifiably the most thirst quenching beer that we've ever brewed, to Mick to to uh, slightly mighty, where it's uh, the same calories as Mick Ultra, but a mighty hoppy beer. So I'm concerned about uh, the drinkers going away from full flavored craft beer over the next ten years. Let's take one more question. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. and we'll So I was interested in um, hearing about both of your personal journeys in terms of you start as this very, very small brewery, and now, you know, by any measure, you're a pretty large company, even though it's small within the, the scope of beer, um, specifically keeping up the, the passion for the business that you've started, and what's that meant? Cool. Okay, yeah, so... Um, as of May, we had 400 coworkers across our five businesses. Uh, now we're, we're part of a company with about 1,800, almost 2,000 coworkers. Um, so it's definitely grown. But I'd say one thing that keeps up the passion for it is that we are continually innovating and growing and learning from the people that have come to work with us at Dogfish Head over the years. I mean, people that are much smarter and technical than us in certain, you know, sort of as Sam was talking about, different superpowers. So we're learning from our coworkers just as much now and over the last 10 years, so that's been pretty cool. And on the innovation side, I think we were tallying up the number of liquids that we're gonna release next year across the distillery, the brewery, our R&D brewery, our brew pub brewery, um, and we're gonna have 200 different unique things coming out next year under the Dogfish brand. Many of them will never get into distribution. It'll be just served in our brew pub or just served at our, at our tasting room um, or, you know, through the distillery. So that, I mean, that kind of fuels passion and excitement because it's always, there's always new stuff coming down the bike. So. Perfect answer. Let's go try some of those innovations, right? <laughs>